The title I was given, What Opportunities and Challenges Does Brexit Open Up for UK Museums? Uh, it, frankly, if I knew all the answers, we'd be out there doing them right away. So today, I, would, I do want to be a little bit provocative. I do want to, I hope, make us think a bit. And most of all, and this is quite important, I was talking to somebody who I use as a, a mentor, a, a coach yesterday, who said that she was just profoundly uh, disappointed uh, and depressed by the whole Brexit thing. And I thought, you know, that's what most of us on our day-to-day -day basis tend to feel about Brexit. Nobody's saying, actually, are there opportunities here? The government is certainly saying we should be looking for them. But I do think we need to enter this era with a positive viewpoint and just think about where are the opportunities. I'll come back to that point a little later on. So the first thing is, what does Brexit mean? And I think you probably know where this is going. Um, if you listen to pronouncements of the current Prime Minister, uh, first of all, there's a justification for why the public voted for Brexit. Uh, and then there's a view based on talking to people since the 23rd of June, that fateful day, that, uh, that the British people have decided. Uh, so Brexit means Brexit. In other words, we're, we're going to go on and we're going to deliver what the people wanted. Uh, since then, lots of uh, other snippets that you can pull out. If you just Google what has Theresa May said on Brexit, you get pages and pages of, of quotes. The, the ones I've selected actually come up over and over again, uh, uh, that the UK cannot possibly remain within the European single market, as staying in it would not mean leaving the, would, be, would mean not leaving the European Union at all. And uh, because, of course, we're going to have to negotiate new terms, and you're not going to give away a negotiating position up front. She has said she's prepared to take the UK into the hardest of Brexits if Brussels and MPs do not back her plan. Um, I guess if you were charged with leading that process, you might actually rationally take that same viewpoint. So, you know, what can we conclude at this point? You know, what are the certainties? We will exit the European Union. I've no doubt about that. There will be no, in, no going back, by which I mean I don't think we will avoid Brexit by any device. And I do think once we're out, we are out. I think we should also expect that our European allies, for the want of a better term, uh, are likely to negotiate very hard. I mean, I think there's, there is some resentment that, that the British people have voted in this way. We shouldn't expect that the negotiations over the period post-triggering Article 50 are going to be simple, uh, and we shouldn't expect that there's going to be very much uh, uh, goodwill towards our negotiating point. So it's going to be a tough negotiation, uh, and I suspect the terms that we, that we get are not going to be great. So a few predictions. And again, this is not, not terribly profound. They're pretty obvious. Um, I think what's been said about the single market means that the so-called Norway and Switzerland models aren't an option. Norway is a member of EFTA and EEA. Uh, Switzerland, uh, only one of those two bodies. But uh, actually, Theresa May is pretty much ruled out being part of the single market, uh, predominantly on the grounds uh, of not wishing to just simply agree to the freedom of movement of employees. So I think we can pretty much take it as red as, as simple freedom of movement of employees across national boundaries within EU member states is not going to happen. And, and the other not terribly profound but obvious point is that there will be a significant gap between Brexit and the achievement of any trade deal with the European Union. Canada, who, ha who have uh, somewhere between 10 and 50 times more experienced trade negotiators has been negotiating a trade deal with the European Union for 10 years and has still not concluded it. Um, so 
I think it's pretty optimistic to assume that we will have a trade deal in place in two to five years. So I think, and Carol's already said it, but I think Brexit really does mean uncertainty, and actually quite, quite a long period of uncertainty. I think we could be going into a, a, a period of five years or more uh, where it is pretty difficult to plot a course uh, on any kind of reliable basis. So, in this organisation, we've tried to think about, well, what, what, what are the factors that are really going to uh, affect us? Uh, what are the drivers of those changes? And is there anything that we can do about them? Or indeed, can we uh, mitigate their effects. So when we think about, as most museums do, audiences and visitation, there are some upsides and there are some downsides. The, the fact that the pound fell so far against the euro means that it's pretty cheap to come to the UK at the moment. Uh, we're seeing record numbers of uh, tourists in London, record numbers of tourists to the UK which we see as an opportunity. Uh, the flip side to that is many people are telling me we're seeing a different sort of tourist from Europe. We're seeing tourists from lower socioeconomic groups, tourists that tend to go to theme parks and shopping brand outlets more than they go to cultural institutions. Now, some of this is anecdote, and it's quite hard to get good data on such things. But the fact that it is cheaper to come to the UK uh, for our European neighbours, uh, we should see as an opportunity. One thing that we haven't talked a lot about uh, uh, within this institution that much is what, what are the perceptions of Britain in Europe as the result of a Brexit vote? Um, I talked to a few uh, European colleagues, people who run equivalent museums in France, Germany, Holland, Belgium. Uh, you do get the sense that there's a certain amount of negativity towards the British at the moment. Let's say even more than usual. Uh, so you've got to factor in what, what that might do to uh, uh, visits to the UK. And then, of course, there's what, what will future visa policy be. Already we're outside the Schengen Agreement, uh, so we control our own borders. Um, I suspect that for uh, visitors to the UK, uh, very little will change. Uh, but when it comes to freedom of movement of employees, I think we're looking at a different situation. If we think about economic and business factors and how they affect us, uh, much, more, much more profound, perhaps. Um, exchange rate. This museum generates quite a lot of income from uh, European sources, uh, which is paid in euros. In the last full fiscal year, we had income from uh, income in euros of over five, five million euros. Um, and of course, with a 20% devaluation, if you convert those euros to sterling, then you are uh, receiving a significantly lower sum of money than might originally have been contracted. Of course, what smart organizations do across all of business is they try and balance outgoings uh, and incoming uh, sources of income in the same currency. Uh, and in fact, last year we had outgoings in euros of 5.2 million uh, euros as well. So I guess the, the lesson there is be, be smart, if you can, uh, about how you hold foreign currency uh, uh, because you can mitigate the impact of uh, exchange rate losses. You don't benefit from exchange rate gains, of course, but I would suggest that for most organizations like ours, prudency is a very good thing. I think in the future, international movement of goods is likely to change. There may well be taxes and duties, so services and goods that we send overseas are likely to be more expensive. Um, they will seem cheaper if the pound is lower, so maybe those two things will balance out. 
Uh, I'm not a I'm not a tax expert by any stretch of the imagination, but VAT, uh, being outside of the VAT and not being part of a harmonized VAT system is likely to have impacts. Um, when it comes to VAT, it never seems to be positive, so you draw your own conclusions. Uh, we may well have different rules around customs, customs clearance, slower movement of goods. It may take longer to get anything done. And again, perceptions of Britain, I think, uh, uh, are a relevant factor here. <laughs> HR issues, it's really around freedom of movement or not of employees. Uh, my working assumption is that uh, employing, uh, employing uh, nationals from e EU member states in, in future is likely to require a visa. Uh, the government uh, view, uh, driven I think by public opinion, uh, is that immigration is too high and I think it is only going to get more difficult to recruit from overseas. Uh, hitherto it has been relatively easy to recruit from the EU. In this museum we have about 125 uh, members of staff, uh, about 12% of our, uh, sorry slightly more, about 15% of our workforce. Uh, who are members of EU, uh, uh, nationals of EU member states. Uh, already we are encountering difficulty in recruiting, let's say, senior research scientists from the European Union because people don't really do not want to take a risk uh, as to what their future status might be. Um, many of us contract out a range of services with uh, lower level blue collar jobs which are typically filled by uh, a lot of uh, EU member state nationals. Uh, so the impact on staffing and the cost of some of these outsourced contracts I think is likely to change. Uh, and again that's likely to be uh, uh, in an upward trajectory not down. And if we think about business travel, it will just get more complicated. I, I suspect the business travel uh, may not require uh, uh, visas, but uh, uh, you never know. For a museum like this one, the direct availability of EU funding, uh, we derive quite a lot of uh, funding for our science from the European Union. Um, I'm glad to say we're still able to apply, and even in the last month, we've uh, achieved five new Marie Curie fellowships. So these are five research posts funded uh, from the European Union. Um, but our ability to do that uh, is likely to be compromised uh, fairly soon. Um, I also think the implications of Brexit on UK government funding need to be thought through. Uh, even this week, the government has announced that the Treasury has asked all government departments to model 3 and 6% cuts for 2019-20. Um, museums, as, as this one, funded directly by DCMS through grant in aid, were expecting flat cash right through to the end of the spending period. So already we're having to think about a worst case scenario, which is uh, uh, a 6% cut in 2019-20. That's a 6% cash cut um, already over a five year period. Flat cash is about a, a 10 or 12% uh, cut in real terms. So these are quite, quite serious consequences. And there is a risk to partnerships with organizations from other EU member states. Um, we participate in a consortium of museums uh, in Europe, uh, of natural history museums, where we have been building up to a very large bid to the Horizon 2020 program. The intellectual leadership of that, of that consortium has come from this museum, but it's quite likely by the time we get to the point of making the application that we will not be able to lead that project. Uh, it's possible we may not even be able to find a way of participating in that project, which would be a very serious outcome. I'm not a lawyer, but I just jotted down a, f a few of the areas of law that are affected. As many of you will know, UK law very often just takes European directives and, and enacts them here. 
here are just a small number that affect an organisation like this one. And depending on what area of business your museum is in, there will be lots of others. Um, it would take hundreds of lawyers, thousands of years probably, to uh, create new acts of parliament to cover all of the European directives that we currently rely on. Uh, but there will undoubtedly be a list within that list uh, where we actually have to do the work and create new acts of parliament. So quite a significant potential change. Maybe there's an opportunity for some of our institutions to get involved in policy debate in those areas and have a positive influence. The talk... The title of the talk did invite me to talk about opportunities, and you'd be glad to know I've got at least one slide, or a couple of slides. So it's based on the premise that Brexit will happen, so we just have to get on with finding ways to compensate. And I'll just give you a few thoughts, which I hope you might carry with you through the rest of the day, um, to, let's say, put more of a positive spin on things. I've always believed personally that periods of change are periods of greatest opportunity. Um, I've used that myself throughout my career. Anytime there's been a change in any organisation I've worked for, I've tended to take the view, let's embrace it, let's go with it, let's see how I can turn that to my advantage. Um, and I haven't done too badly as a result. Um, more pragmatically, Organisations that think like this have tended to do better than the market. The classic example is probably Royal Dutch Shell, who invented a business technique called scenario planning. They were the one oil company that predicted the collapse, or at least had a plan for, the collapse of the oil price in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, smart move. They had actually looked at different scenarios for their business based on different potential outcomes. They were the only oil company that really thought that the oil company, that the oil price could fall. They did fantastically well compared to the rest of the market. So I think there are three areas that we're thinking about here at this, this museum, that new business models will emerge, so we ought to be looking for what are they and how do, we, how do we turn them to our advantage. Clearly, there will be new forms of funding that we need to find. If we have to replace all of our European funding, where are we going to find it? And I think the answer probably lies, and Carol's alluded to this herself, that we may end up doing a lot more work in partnership. We may get access to funds from other nations through working in partnership with uh, other institutions. And as a case in point, we are working currently very actively, not just with a consortium of European museums of natural history, but we've now formed a global consortium of 12 natural history museums, which by working in partnership should give us access to European funds, albeit through a back door, but it will also give us, I think, access to funds from North America as well, which is uh, you cannot achieve uh, as a UK-based institution by any other route. So those are my not very profound thoughts. I was horrified to see that there were 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> but by successfully overrunning, and I know Carol will want to keep us to time, um, I probably truncated the questions, but I'm happy to take questions. Just don't expect that I've got all the answers. Thank you, Mike. Back row. And I'm trying to chat. I've got microphones, so. Could you identify yourself in your institution? Of course. I'm Lucy and I'm from the British Museum. Thank you, Lucy. I may not be able to release the information, but have you already noticed with your current staff base? I can hear you, but I'm not sure that everybody else can. But Hello. Have you noticed with your current staff at, at the Natural History Museum who come from the EU um, Partnership Nations a reduction or a drop? Are people already indicating their future plans? I think, I think the, the short answer to that is I haven't got the data, but anecdotally we're not losing staff at this point. Uh, but it is getting harder to recruit, and certainly at, cer at certain levels it's getting harder to recruit. I mean, the other difficult thing is uh, staff expect leadership. They expect 
us to say something. Legally, we cannot, we just cannot provide advice to members of staff on this area. I mean, we're absolutely forbidden from doing so legally. So it's actually pretty, pretty tricky. All we can do is make sort of warm, encouraging noises and point to things that people should be looking out for. Um, but we can't do really much more than that. And I find that rather frustrating, but, but for very obvious reasons, that, that's the way it has to be. Other questions? Working? Is that working? Yep. Thanks. Nicholas Watts, Commonwealth Association of Museums. I just wonder if any thought has been given to the risk of, of to integrity of collections if when trying, sort of going cap in hand and some would say gun in mouth to uh, negotiate with foreign governments, I think of India as one example, or Caribbean countries to enhance trade, if a quid pro quo for that is, well, give us back what you took during empire, <laughs> and you have, in your, you have that in your collection. I see that as a, as, as a possible risk. If we're doing shell-type scenarios, I don't know where the, the positive would be. But have people started thinking about that? Um, I, I think there's an inevitable shift over time that these pressures are going to arise no matter what happens, whether we're a part of the European Union or not. And I think it's something that the museum community needs to think about. Um, of course, m for many of us, we are bound by Act of Parliament and, and we can simply say, legally forbidden. I can't even negotiate that, um, which may not be great from the point of view of negotiating funding from a foreign government, but that's at least the position that we would have to hold at this point. Um, it's a bit of a cop-out, really. It's a, it does make the negotiation easier when, when you've got a, uh, when your negotiating point is, is completely immovable, but, um, but that's the way it is. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very valid question. If you look around the world now, lots of uh, governments uh, overseas are looking at, uh, let's say, repatriation of objects, not just uh, the one that affects this institution where we, where we do have a legal uh, uh, requirement to consider repatriation, which is in human remains. Other questions? Hi, Lizzie Moriarty. Um, I just have a question about um, research funding and the British government's position on that um, post-Brexit, um, effectively replacing some of the EU funding. What sort of... Um, lobbying is going on with institutions like the Natural History Museum, which is a major research organization, and universities, in the conversation with government, basically? We have decided uh, we can make our case to our own government department, and we can make our case to uh, other relevant government departments, like Bayes, uh, and we are certainly doing that. But actually, we are such a small part of the overall research community that we are just trying to network with other institutions and make sure that they are aware um, that apart from the obvious research institutions within this country, there are lots of other ones that need to be thought about. So we are uh, actively working with organizations like the Royal Society, um, who are very active in this area uh, and certainly are, are, are very active in the whole area about freedom of movement of employees uh, in the, within the research community. Um, so from my point of view, we just have to network as far and as fast as we can to get, a, to get our point across. Um, and, it, and it is quite difficult. One of the challenges we face as an institution overall is that everybody knows us as the wonderful Victorian building with the dinosaurs. And very few people remember that we've got 350 scientists working here, producing over a thousand peer-reviewed research papers every year. It's a it's a big enterprise. One last question. Can I ask my name? Yeah, go on then. Go on then. Go on then. No, sorry, was there, one here? there was one from yeah. the floor.
So mine was more of a statement in a kind of spirit of optimism, as I know that that, that was a kind of one thread of this morning, which was about um, the kind of perceptions of the British since the vote. And it was just to say, really, that kind of anecdotally, um, my experience and the experience of some of our colleagues is actually that um, perceptions haven't become more negative in terms of our working relationships within the sector with it, with our European colleagues. And actually, there's almost a spirit of solidarity and a desire to work more closely than ever um, in the face of what many of us feel is a kind of negative a negative way forward. So that, that was just a, a no, I, I, positivity. Well, thank you for that observation. I would, I would, I would agree, certainly. Uh, the Brexit vote has not affected our direct relationship with our European partners, other than the obvious question is whether we can actually lead a, a, a bid in future uh, to something like Horizon 2020. Good. Well, look, thank you for your, thank you for your time. I think my time has expired, and I know <laughs> Carol you, wants to keep to timetable. Hope you have an enjoyable day, and I hope you have a chance to look around the museum as well as uh, sitting in uh, in this lecture theatre. Can we thank Mike for his presentation?